Welcome to the Courage Over Cowardice podcast, where I cover topics and issues that'll help you take a stand for Christ in culture. More than ever, followers of Jesus need courage to stand up, speak up, and to live out their faith because people need to know that there's a God in heaven that loves them, and it is his truth that sets people free. Thanks for listening today, and I hope that you enjoyed the episode. Hey, I want to welcome you to the Courage Over Cowardice podcast. It is my privilege to have uh, Dr. Brittany LaBeouf. Brittany has a PhD in kinesiology and a, car- and a career as a scientist. During her schooling, she fell further and further out of Christianity, looking for peace in all the wrong places. In 2021, she found herself radically changed by an encounter with the Holy Spirit that has inspired her to pursue Jesus in a whole new way by sharing her testimony and discussing Christianity. Uh, health and culturally relevant topics on her podcast called Heaven and Health. I'd encourage you to check that out. Uh, She also, uh, kind of least important in this conversation, but important to me, she also is my niece, has a beautiful family, and I'm so excited about what God's doing in her life. Brittany, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. And so you've been on with us a few times and will be continuing the future, um, kind of focusing on your expertise. I wanted to... uh, do this podcast in relation to specifically something uh, that has been ongoing, but uh, has kind of come to uh, fruition in our community, in our greater community, and that was Drag Queen Story Hour. So uh, we know that's ongoing. It's it's being pushed and pervasive in culture, and there's a lot of uh, <laughs> interesting perspectives on that. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit and talk about and help those that are listening understand, okay, what is Drag Queen Story Hour? And understand that it's a it's a small part of something that's far greater and more insidious uh, in our culture. And so let me set it up in this way. The Bible says in the book of Colossians chapter 2, It says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense, which is much of academia today, by the way, uh, that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you're also uh, so you're uh, also are complete through your union with Christ, who is head over every ruler and authority. So we're in a culture of TikTok theology uh, where we. Uh, have been accepting ideologies that are uh, demonic, that are debased, they're evil, and they are focused not just on adults, but they're uh, really focused on young people, and especially children, uh, which is pretty outrageous. Uh, so let's jump in. Drag Queen Story Hour, it's getting a lot of headlines, continues to, to um, and it was in our area this past weekend. What is Drag Queen Story Hour? Kind of give us a little bit of a background, and then what it's a part of that's much larger and even more sinister. Yeah, so Drag Queen Story Hour, like you said, it's it's been around, but it didn't organically just come to be. It's very t- intentional based on something that's known in the academic literature known as drag pedagogy. So it's a specific strategy to use drag queens to further the agendas that are sort of embedded into what we would call queer theory. And it's it really came to fruition. It started in San Francisco, no surprise there, in a big major city that was really progressive. But we've seen that it's kind of infiltrated into places all over the country and the world, I'm, I'm pretty certain. Um, and even our small towns, we're seeing this. And I think people uh, naively believe that it's something that it's not. But really, the whole purpose of it is to uh, expose children to a performative approach to gender using drag queens. And so this isn't just about the drag queens themselves. Obviously, drag performances and drag clubs have been around for a long time. But this introduction of it into children's spaces is intentional and designed to create this sort of experience for children that is a little jarring different to expose them to something that's iner- inherently sexual um, and really to further the agenda of a lot of what queer theory promotes and what they want. And it's not just, you know, it, 
your child sees a drag queen, the things that go on at these story hours. And they're not just at libraries. This happens in schools. We see this at the quote unquote family friendly drag events, things like that. Um, and it's encouraging uh, the idea that living queerly is, should be the goal to be a mm -hmm. flourishing society, that kids should strive to do that. And so queer becomes an action and it's a yeah. really politicized identity. It's not just the idea of kids not being straight or being gay, um, which yeah. you'll see all of that conflated a lot around the drag queen conversation and sort of the drag queen story hour apologists who say, yeah. oh, there's nothing wrong with the drag queens. Like they're innocent, they're nice people, uh, this, that, and the other, not knowing the really evil ideology that a lot of this stuff is based on. I mean, I didn't know a lot of it yeah. and it is really dark. So, yeah. Uh, so before yeah. we jump into that, let me just, uh, let me just say this. I mean, it's, it's interesting culturally that, um, and we've seen this, uh, through posts, we've watched it. Uh, I mean, on my posts, lots of other uh, people, I posted something recently. It said, stop sexualizing children. And uh, we know that culturally, this is a broad problem culturally, the sexualization of children. It's very intentional, whether it's Disney, Nickelodeon, um, the veil is being removed that the intention is to uh, change the, the morality of Scripture uh, and the underpinnings of civilization as we know it for, you know, uh, all of human history to somehow mainstream this with kids, which goes against our very... Uh, nature and understanding and even our instincts as, uh, uh, you know, maternal and paternal instincts as parents and desiring to protect. And I just wanted, before you jumped into queer theory, I just wanted to say this um, within that, um, though I know it's different than the uh, LGBTQ++ agenda, we also need to understand that, um, you know, I refer to it as the uh, LGBTQ++ sex cult because it is a cult way of thinking. Um, and Romans chapter one, and just from a biblical perspective, but we see this played out as well. Um, we are we are living in Sodom, and so many Christians, or quote unquote self-professed Christians, are saying there's no problem this, with this. There's no issue. And I can't. I'm not going to take time to read the whole chapter, but Romans uh, chapter one, and it's shown in other parts of scriptures. It says God abandoned them because they didn't want to worship God as God. They wanted to be God. I can be whatever I want to be. I can change my gender, have sex with whoever I want to, whatever I want to do, I can do. So, uh, you know, the Bible warns us not to have any other gods before us. Um, and Paul says, hey, when you decide that you want to be God, here's what happens. And it says in verse 24, God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. And so as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped other things. And it goes on to say that they exchanged uh, natural use or natural sex sexual relations between men and women for unnatural, which the, which the Bible uh, is explicit against. Uh, in every facet, it wasn't a, you know a new creation that we added to. That's always been the case because it goes against nature. And then it goes on to say, because of the sexual immorality that now is pervasive, where you do whatever you want, it says, since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. I mean, we're doing things now that I believe would make Sodom and Gomorrah blush. Uh, their lives became full of every kind of wicked, sin, greed, hate, envy, moral quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. And they're not just misunderstood. And I think w that's what we need to be clear about. The Bible is really clear about things uh, that we refuse to be. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, have no mercy, and uh, they... Uh, they know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve punishment or death, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them. So I wanted to read that kind of in the setup of queer theory, because as you, uh, as you begin our talk, talk for our, uh, this next segment of the podcast about queer theory and the goals of it, it is different uh, in one sense than the LGBTQ you know, plus plus agenda, but it coincides and uh, same spirit, different face. But every, I think everybody needs to understand what queer theory is. So I kind of talked a lot with this setup. I explained to us what what is this uh, uh, thing that you call queer theory that comes from the critical theories. 
and w how is it connected to Drag Queen or Story Hour, and why do we need to understand it and know about it? So the floor is yours. Yeah, um, you know, that's, it, that's all really important context because you'll see that some of the, all of the really core tenets of queer theory are directly oppositional to what you just said in scripture. And yeah. it's, when you lay it out that way, it's even more clear, um, which as Christians is really important to us. But I think by and large, many people just are not aware. And so when we think about the evils that are coming out of this, I think people are being exposed to it in a way that they really have never understood before because it's kind of filtered with this guise of being nice and being inclusion being inclusive you'll see the tenets of queer theory all throughout dei initiatives um, and once you kind of hear what i'm about to describe you'll be able to point it out a lot more easily and so yeah. when we talk about queer theory it's it's sort of an it's based on an a set of academic theories now. At the time, it wasn't necessarily always co called queer theory when a lot of these ideas were coming to fruition, but it really merges several disciplines. So when we talk about cultural studies, gender studies, feminism, sociology, they all kind of come together to create queer theory. And it's really rooted in an activism, like a political activism. and the goal of it would be to deconstruct, which is a term we hear a lot now, and really challenge tradi tradition um, in every sense of the word in regard to gender, sexuality, identity, power, very similar to the critical theories, but it's really focused on this sexuality aspect and this yeah. identity aspect and how it creates activism out of it. And there are a lot of philosophies that this sort of merged out of going all the way. I mean, there's a very extensive history to queer theory, but even, I mean, when we talk about transgender ideology and kind of where some of this stuff comes from, a lot of it is not unsurprisingly based on this idea that children need to be exposed to very sexual material, that they are inherently sexual beings, um, and that by priming them to this behavior that they will be less resistant to um, this change in, nor in normality and that there really yeah. is no such thing as normal because there are no boundaries essentially between yeah. good and evil, between adult and child. You see this all throughout the people who kind of created or were the, I would say, forefathers of queer theory and their thinking. So yeah. we can think about people like Michel Foucault. These are postmodern philosophers. So Michel Foucault, for example, was a French postmodern philosopher who was a pervert, which also, if you have kids listening, like younger kids listening, some of this stuff is very uh, inappropriate. So just heads up if you're listening to this around small children. Um, but he was a very well-known French philosopher who really idolized the work of Nietzsche. And he himself was a pedophile who mm -hmm. loved kinky sex, including with children. And mm -hmm. he, one of his things was he argued that the age of consent should be eradicated, which at the time was 15 years old in France. And he pushed this idea forward because he himself wanted to normalize his sexual proclivities. And so this idea of there's, you're just like, you need to be freed from society, that these norms are actually caging you in, that we need to eradicate that so people can be free to live how they want and who they want to be. That sounds familiar. That's, this is what it's based yeah. on. This was way back yeah. in the 19, what, 60s. Um, and so you have people like that who the work of, of a lot of these more modern philosophers was based on this these ideas. We have people yeah. like Dr. John Money, who we talk about when we talk about the transgender ideology as well, who, again, was a psychologist who did very disgusting experiments on children that at yeah. the time were seemingly, I mean, I wouldn't say they were accepted, but they happened. Yeah. Um, and that included, you know, having children perform sexual acts on each other, including siblings. Yeah. 
and these really just um, inappropriate and disgusting and depraved experiments to create this notion that children are inherently sexual, they need to be exposed to sexuality from an early age, and that we can use children as a way to enhance our own um, inappropriate sexual desires. And yeah. so you see that as a theme sort of throughout. Now, I'm not saying that every single person who was involved in queer theory was a pedophile, but there is this in, embedding of that in just the very way we even think about these theories and how they are yeah. activated in society. Yeah, and I, I want you to continue on that, but that's uh, that's the embodiment, or you you think about Romans chapter one. I didn't read the whole chapter, but it basically, you know, says that if you want to worship yourself, then you're going to be sexually perverse. It's the progression, and your perversion gives you over to a debased mind, um, and where you're thinking, you don't have the ability to to reason as a normal per person. Logic, like I've had people over the years, different comments uh, that would. Um, would defend people like John Money and things that they did. And I think, uh, well, I know the reason is it's connected to one's own perversion, to excuse one's own sin uh, so that you're not held accountable by God. Because if you don't want to repent from your sin, you don't want to turn from it. You don't want to accept that, that God is holy and he commands us to repent and live according to his standards by the spirit through forgiveness uh, found in Jesus, then you have to create your own religion to live by so that you can live with yourself. Um, and this is part and parcel, part of the cultural revolution to redefine reality, to redefine morality, and to create a, a set of laws to live by that do not include God as if that will remove the stain and judgment of sin. And, uh, you know, when you, as you're talking about this, it's just, it's so clear within that. And so if you're listening to this and, you know, maybe you're uh, against what we're talking about, maybe you're a researcher, or, you know, whatever, um, you know, the reality is, is this is a, this is the outworking from the perversion of our own hearts. And we don't want to acknowledge that. We don't want to, uh, we don't want to turn from it. So we create uh, nonsense. We know it's nonsense. We know it's ridiculous. I mean, on its face, even things like Drag Queen Story Hour, a dude dressing up as a woman is odd. It's always been odd. It will always be odd, especially, you know, clown-like. And why would a dude dressed up as a clown-like female need an audience with children? Um, the outworking of that, it's always interesting to hear people say, well, you just need to understand. It's like, no, I don't actually. Uh, Everyone knows it's sick, but when you war against God himself and you have no foundation, uh, then the outworking of that is depraved mind. And so I just say it's because of depraved mind. Uh, so I just want to interject that. Continue on. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's good. And it's, and it's true. A lot of the goal of queer theory is not to create a, you know, God gives us an identity that's really firm in him and his truth, but queer theory seeks to destroy that. So they don't want you to have a stable identity. That's why there is so much confusion. And we know that that confusion doesn't come from God. It comes from Satan. And you see that all the time. And the term, even the term queer itself can mean a million different things, depending on the, it can really mean anything because there is no yeah. truth and the truth can change all the time. And so yeah. that's a key component of it, which is, you know, obviously oppositional to what we believe as Christians. Um, and so when we think about sort of the tenets of queer theory and the things that make it up, one of these things is this destruction of what we would call a gender binary. So having male and female, uh, heterosexual, homosexual, normal, deviant, it blurs all those lines and wants to not create lines, actually. Yeah. It doesn't want there to be binaries. Everything is a spectrum. You'll hear this, hear this a lot within the queer theory language and that everything is a spectrum. And I, I, it, it creates just this mass sense of confusion. I read that in 2022, a Pew Research survey found that um, it was like half of adults, young adults, ages 18 to 29, said that someone's gender could be different from the sex that they were assigned at birth. 
And 50%. Yeah. That is not a small number. And yeah. people truly believe believe that. And it's because yeah. of this idea of the destruction of gender binaries and that you can identify as whatever you want on whatever day you want and that it can change because gender is fluid. And the younger that you can get a child to believe this, the more accepting they will be of that idea, which is very confusing for, yeah. for a kid to understand. So that's one of the that's one of the key tenets of queer theory, though. You need to be bought into this idea that there is no binary because from there, the outworkings of that can be really anything you want. If there's no such thing as normal, then anything can be normal. So at the same time, you're saying nothing is normal and everything is normal. And that's when things like pedophilia can come into play and inappropriate material comes into play and sexualizing children comes into play because it's all a quote unquote interpretation. People will yeah. say things like drag queen story hour is an interpretation. It's not inherently sexual. Okay. Why aren't drag queens dressed like Mrs. Doubtfire? Yeah. They're dressed overly sexual, fake boobs with lots of cleavage, fishnet stockings, thongs, Lots of makeup. It's a caricature of a woman. It's not really what yeah. women look like. And yeah. that's, that is a, philosoph a philosophical idea of, destruct of deconstructing the gender binary. There yeah. was a very prominent feminist, she's still around today, Judith Butler, who really brought, brought these ideas forward in the 1990s, who said that basically gender is a performance, similar to the way that when we... Um, get dressed and go to work, that we are performing that job, that that is the same way that we portray gender, which is obviously yeah. two very different things. But that's where you saw this influx of what I think in culture we would call now like butch lesbians, where mm -hmm. they're a women who wanted to present more masculine. And yeah. so because of that, they created this idea of what's known as gender performativity. And drag kind of falls into that category because it's a performance. And yeah. no one is inherently a drag queen. You have to go out and get dressed in that way. But to your point, that's not normal. And any, any man who has the desire to go out and dress like that and perform for little kids, that's not normal. But they would say, proponents of queer theory would say, well, what's normal? There is no normal. That's normal yeah. for me. That's my truth. Yeah. 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 And so you see the outworking of postmodern thought that is nonsensical. It's illogical. I mean, if you just carry it out to its expected end, everybody can see how crazy it is. An example of that would be pedophilia. We'd say, okay, that's really sick. You know, child molestation, rape, perversion, all, it's really sick. Um, people need to be protected from that. Children need to be protected from that. But this is uh, the implicit and explicit outworking of that philosophy. It's one thing. It's not that this doesn't happen. This is where a lot of the opponents of uh, Christian thought, Western thought, morality, which all derives itself from the scripture, though we don't thank God for that, uh, but we live off the blessing of that uh, within our culture. You know, we see, uh, we see kind of within, um, um, within this, within this uh, mindset like okay uh morality is important but when we don't thank god and we and we determine that we're going to uh live according to our own um uh, perspective and mindset uh then who are you to say someone else is wrong if someone likes little children who are you to impose your morality? Because it can be whatever it wants to be. Like you said before, it's a spectrum. And under the guise of this nonsense, this, this, uh, uh, the empty, hollow philosophies of this world that uh, Paul talked about uh, in Colossians uh, and many other places, and what uh, the Ro book of Romans talks about as well, the goal of this is confusion. The author of confusion is Satan. Uh, it's oppositional to the created order, what God desires. You don't have to be a Christian to accept normalcy, science, and reality, although it borrows from a Christian worldview. And so I think people are so confused by this. And uh, I think in recent years, we've, we've unleashed hell in our culture. It's a cultural revolution that's been ongoing, but has been fomented and pushed heavy 
uh, in uh, psychological operations um, that we see, even especially since 2020, uh, where we see so much, and you mentioned uh, the younger generation that's accepting these things as normal. Uh, it follows the same pattern if you go back and read historically um, how uh, Mao in, uh, took over China, the Maoist revolution, the cultural revolution of China, and how the Red Guard and the young people were brainwashed to the extent where they were willing to uh, not only leave their families, but to kill their parents um, for this revolution that they were a part of. We see that happening right now. And uh, I'm going to give it back to you in a moment, but I just want to stop from saying this is why if you're a pastor or a leader or a Christian or you're a parent or, you know, whatever your platform is, if you are silent, uh, we hear a lot about silence, you know, breeds complicity. Uh, and that's kind of taken to, um, I think, you know, really nonsensical terms in our, in our culture. But we see an aspect of that. If you stay silent uh, when all of these ridiculous ideologies are being pushed and pervasive and you accept as normal, oh, it's just totally cool with confused dudes to, uh, to you know, uh, confused children, then you and I, we allow this to happen. We allow our culture to continue to a spiral of degradation. And we say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. And I just want to say to everyone here, as you hear these things, there is something not only you can do, but something you need to do. You have a voice, you have a platform, and if you're a believer, you should be giving God's opinion on these matters. If you're not a Christian and you're, or if you are a Christian and you're like totally cool with these things, just stop claiming to be a Christian because you may not realize that you're deceived, but you are. This is not a Christian philosophy or worldview. Uh, it's actually in, in total opposition to. And so, I, I just want to challenge everybody, as, as, as Brittany's going through and, and talking about these things, I hope that you understand, especially pastors, because pastors and leaders have been so passive. They don't protest anything. They won't talk about anything you know, specific uh, like this from the platform, uh, lest we, lest we you know, might upset someone. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me. If, if you would cause any of these little ones to stumble, it would be better that you would not even be born. And so I think we should have the same passion that God has in relation to these things. Uh, so you talked about fluid, uh, fluidity uh, and confusion. Let's kind of pick up uh, there and keep going uh, because uh, there is no right, there is no wrong. Every man does what is right in his own eyes, as it says in the Old Testament. Uh, kind of continue on with queer theory in relation to that. Yeah, so you'll see this all throughout the critical theories as well, but this idea of intersectionality and it, it plays into this as well because having a queer identity puts you in an oppressed category. And so drag queens are oppressed. And so they automatically become, if you're a straight white man, which is lowest on the totem pole when it comes to intersectionality, you can just say, you know, you're gay, you're trans, you're this, you're that, you're a drag queen, and you automatically receive this oppressor status based on the components of critical theory and how we view society based on that way. It's the same yeah. outworkings in queer theory. So having several social identities and not only that, but politically fighting for them, for those identities and, yeah. um, you know, creating this social aspect of it to fight this idea of heteronormativity, as they would call it, and how that is actually toxic to uh, our world because, you know, social structures have been put in place that favor straight white people and straight people in general. So we really need to oppose that strongly and, you know, not rock the boat. And we need to just be quiet if you're a straight white person. Or if you're a Christian or any of these other oppressor classes that they sort of, you know, make, they just add to the list all the time. So um, because of that, if you are not part of this category, you need to be fighting the same fight as this. And so all of that is part of queer theory as well, the intersectionality piece of it, the political and social activism piece of it. Um, and it really, it, it does deceive people 
And I don't think, I think this is really important. I, I recently read the book, The Queering of the American Child, which I highly recommend for mm. parents and grandparents. It's, it's not a very academic read. It's actually a pretty easy read, but it goes through all of all the stuff that we're talking about and gives really specific examples. But in the beginning of that book, they kind of put people into three categories. And the largest category of the proponents of queer theory are not the people necessarily who know all of this stuff or are actively fighting to queer society. It, they really aren't. They are people who are deceived, who believe that they are doing what's best for their children and just trying to be, quote unquote, empathetic and inclusive and all of that. But they are social. They are emotionally manipulated into believing things that are not true. So you'll you'll hear often that a lot of the things that I'm describing right now, that's just made up right wing propaganda. Actually, it's not. It's a you can study queer theory in yeah. academic institutions everywhere. They yeah. just think that we're too dumb to figure that out. But if yeah. you go to any sort of academic journal and look up queer theory, all of these things are outlined very explicitly in the writing of queer theorists themselves. It's not like I'm making this up. <laughs> it's not like this came from nowhere. It's documented throughout history, but no one really ever talks about it except for certain sects that are pushing this forward. And that's why it's going at the pace that it is now. This isn't just organically happening, which I think yes. a lot of parents naively believe that, oh, like, we're just a more accepting society now and people just feel more comfortable to be who they really are. No, this, that is not what is happening here. The rate at which this, these things are happening and occurring is exponential and it doesn't happen organically. Social yeah. scientists will say that this is part of a, a well-constructed plan to create these identities and create this culture in an entire generation. And that's why you yeah. see so many more of the younger generation identifying as these things that are confusing and you don't even know what they mean because they themselves have been taught from the time they were a very young age that they can be whoever they want to be. And you have yes. adults affirming it all the way down. And you talked about communist China and how, how this is all so parallel to that. How did that end up? Where do, do you think that gay people and trans people and drag queens are treated well in China? Yeah. You know, like I don't I don't think that many people have really thought through that. And we need to. It's not yeah. some wacky doodle conspiracy. These are things that have happened in history, but they're just counting on us never looking it up, never doing any research. And that being called a bigot is going to be enough to silence us into saying, OK, fine. You can have the drag queen story hour. We won't say anything. It's okay. And what we need to be doing is saying, no, this is wrong. I don't want this in my community. Everything that it stands for is against what I believe is good for society. That's what they're doing by trying to yeah. promote it. We have every yes. right to oppose it, especially as the church. So I think we need to just lean into a lot of this stuff that is diff honestly it's it's kind of difficult to accept that this these things really happened and that people really think this way but yeah. that comes back to having a biblical worldview too and that the way we view human nature is different from how the world views human nature and that people yeah. are not all inherently good and there is That's evil right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there actually is a binary. And everybody instinctively knows that. Even people that disagree would say, you're wrong. <laughs> they would claim a binary and say, I mean, which is interesting because well, it's like, why identify as being right? Uh, you see the, this, the nonsensical, you don't have to have like, you know, Brittany, uh, you know, is highly intelligent. She has her PhD. She's able to and, you know, kind of parse these things out in ways that, you know, my mind doesn't necessarily work and maybe your mind doesn't work that way, but it doesn't take, you don't have to have a lawyer mind, mind or a PhD mind or whatever. You just have to pause and stop for a second and say, okay, hold on. Uh, that you need to understand that uh, empathy 
has been redefined and weaponized that everything should be accepted. And um, one of the things that I saw being pushed out was, you know, and it's it's been ongoing. It's it's during this political season. You'll see this a lot. Uh, our uh, d debased uh, uh, president has pushed this quite a bit uh, as well. And it's the saying that hate has no home here. Well, hate has no home unless you're unless you're a Christian. Uh, then we we hate what you stand for. Unless you you know love family, then we hate what you stand for. We won't say it, but we'll marginalize you. We'll try to silence you. Uh, we'll put all of our activism against family. Uh, and it's so interesting. You know, hate has no has no home. And so many times as Christians, because most Christians don't have a biblical worldview, the majority do not. And many people that think they're going to heaven and believe they're Christians. Uh, yeah, I think you got to go back and read the scriptures. It says, broad is the pathway that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. It's not hard to get to heaven. We have to accept Jesus for that. He paid the price for the sin of humanity. The hard part of that is uh, laying down your opinion and repenting of trying to be God and accepting God's word is true. And we see that within, you know, where... Uh, within where we are culturally, uh, there's seemingly an unwillingness for uh, clarity. There's an unwillingness for people to stand. Well, it's not loving. There's not enough empathy there. And there are certain things that we should hate. I hate the sexualization of children. I think it's evil. I have no problem saying I hate that. And uh, I, I think it's wrong. We need to stand against it and everyone that, that stands for it. Um, there are some things that we should hate. I hate when uh, people are murdered and raped and mistreated. There are things specifically in Scripture. The Bible says that God hates. Um, so uh, for those of you that are believers, I want to encourage you, let's not have a bumper sticker mentality of the Christian faith where we just accept everything, we just love everyone, and it's no big deal. That is such a childish coloring book, uh, you know, um, uh, immature way of thinking because there are ideologies and things culturally in our world that are so destructive, that are so evil. We have the historical data. We see the outworking of that in our day. I mean, even the chemical castration of children, we're treating and manipulating teenagers and, and young children and treating and them as Frankenstein all for our own uh, gain and self-acceptance. I just think, you know, God abhors that and we should, uh, we should as well. Uh, I just want to uh, challenge you uh, within that as you hear what Brittany is uh, doing such a, uh, a great job of explaining. This is in our schools. It's in our libraries. It's in academia. It's being taught through social uh, emotional learning and college uh, through uh, the various uh, theories and studies that are offered. And um, you would do well to educate yourself and make a decision that it doesn't matter what man says. Ultimately, I fear what the Lord says, and I want to stand for that. Um, so, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, not okay. sorry, but I just want to interject yeah. that in that uh, in that moment um, as we're talking about the political and social aspects of this and the activism that's there, yet the pervasive silence of uh, normal uh, people, not just Christians, but those who accept morality, they're accepting Christian morality, but would believe that is, is so important. And we have to awaken in this moment because it only gets far worse from here. Yeah. And, uh, and two, I think when you're having conversations with people about this, engaging with people about this, understanding that everyone has a limit, as like you were saying, everyone, there's a binary you just have to find it with people. Everyone knows that there's a point where they draw the line. Yeah. And you would have thought that for a lot of people that that point was pedophilia. But now we're just seeing it being pushed. People's lines are being pushed and blurred more and more and more because more people aren't willing to stand firm and say, no, that's where I draw the line. And so I'm speaking to as someone who used to be caught up in all of this. I've been to drag clubs before. I've been around drag queens before. And because of that, I've personally experienced the depravity and filth that goes on there. None of which I ever thought was appropriate for kids. Um, but it is. 
I mean, you're talking about an over-sexualized performances to sexual music, you know, just the things that go on in a drag club, they're the same people who were saying, yes, please come into our schools, come into our public libraries, please come, come, come around my kids. They're the same people who the night before were doing that. And so it just yeah. makes you wonder why, why there would be a vested interest in exposing children to this. And a lot of it, I think, is just, yeah, they want to be accepted by society. And because kids are ignorant and don't know any better, mm-hmm. they don't, you know, and parents are taking them. And you'll see this a lot of times when you watch clips of this or footage or pictures of kids who are mm-hmm. at these events, they look terrified. Rightly yes. so, because they are confused. They're like, why does this person look this way? And they have a beard like my dad, but they're wearing a dress like my mom. It's It creates a very confusing experience, which is intentional. It's to make them question reality, to make them question what is normal. And then you have parents who are also delusional, who are saying, ignore all of your instincts that you have accept this as normal and and enjoy being read this story the stories by the way if you go to the drag queen story hour website they are all um all of the storylines and the topics of the books that they are reading are inappropriate as well they often can all grooming it's yes they're they're talking about you know trans identities they're talking about um homosexual relationships and overly sexual material um they're the books of themselves that they are reading are also inappropriate. So it's not like they're going in there and reading like some classic children's story. Most of the time they're reading this intentionally and by calling it family friendly, they are tricking parents into thinking that they mean, yes, come invite your whole family. But I've real, I, the more that I've been reading about this and several people kind of bring this up is that, The idea of family and queer theory is not your family that birthed you and raised you. It is your new queer family who is Mm -hmm. accepting of your identity, who will never say that God created you in his image. They will never challenge your wacky doodle identity of the week when you say that you're a Mm -hmm. pansexual dog or whatever. They'll never question any of it because they're your queer family. They're your real family. And they groom kids into believing this by attending events like Drag Queen Story Hour, reading the material that's from it, attacking them on social media by saying things like, I'm your mom now. If you need acceptance, you can come to me. If your real family doesn't accept you, that is what they mean by family friendly. They don't mean this is going to make you closer to your parents. This is going to help your family thrive in society. They don't, they want to de- structure the family they see the family as a tool of white supremacy goes back to critical race theory they want to see that broken down in every single aspect of society and we can't be so naive to believe that it's just an innocent an innocent little drag queen coming in to read a nice little book to your to your little three-year-old and that you're going to go on and that's it. it it it's not it is not that and yeah. if you thought that in the past i get it I once too fell into that trap, but you very quickly realize when you look into this stuff that it is so much darker and depraved than you would ever imagine. And if you're Christian listening to this, I would highly encourage you to pray on this and to ask God to make your heart break for what breaks his, because this is an attack on his design and it does break his heart to see this. And the longer that we just act like it's innocent and loving to not say anything and to be inclusive and accept this, this stuff um, is not what God calls us to do. He calls us to do the hard things sometimes. And that means standing up against evil. And this is evil. Yeah. Well said. Um, I think most people are shocked in the place that we are so quickly that we're having the conversations that we're having about things that were always uh, a part of comedies, uh, were mocked on Saturday Night Live. They're in, you know, not very long ago in different comedies where it was made fun of. And because of the abnormality, because of the extremism, 
Um, yet we see within um, this Maoist woke cultural revolution that we're living through, um, uh, this be uh, intentionally brought about. And I just want to say it's happening in your schools. It's being taught in your schools. And then you might say it's not in my school. You know, I talked to the principal. I talked. Most of them don't even know how it's being brought in. And if it's not a part of the curriculum, it's a part of uh, those who have been brainwashed in these theories in recent years to become an activist in our culture. Uh, it takes a very short period of time to manipulate young people. Uh, I was just listening in, uh, to uh, a girl testify, um, uh, Landon, um, uh, Robbie and Landon Starbuck, they put out a uh, movie, it's really important. Um, he'll be at our uh, Courage Conference and be talking about that in, in August. But uh, they put out a clip and there she was, uh, it was an interview with a young lady who was, she was 12 years old. And by the time she was 13, um, she was groomed into having a double mastectomy. Um, she was just confused going through puberty. And because of these activist adults that are perverse in their mind, that have been given over to the doctrine of demons, as it talks about in scripture, the worship of self, weaponized empathy. Well, we love these kids. We want to protect them from killing themselves. Literally have uh, attempted to ruin this young lady's uh, life. Now she comes back and she's like, I, I wish I would have never done that. I don't know if I'll ever be able to have children. And these stories are happening over and over and over again. And I think it's time, and this happens a lot, especially like it's interesting from the social contagion aspect. So much of this is middle class white people uh, and middle class white women. Uh, mm -hmm. And if that's you listening, you're offended. Good. Be offended. I hope that you'll change uh, your perspective because you're being manipulated to be an abuser, to be a groomer of evil. And you may say, oh, I just don't know about. It. No, that's exactly what's happening. And so you have to push back. You have to challenge. If you really love God, you really love your kids, um, then you'll tell them no. You'll guard what they are reading. You'll guard what's getting into their heart. And people say it doesn't make a big deal. There's a reason that they'll spend millions of dollars for 30 seconds at a Super Bowl uh, commercial because it hacks your brain and will influence you for the rest of your life. They don't do it just to spend money. Uh, this is important. That's why we have to renew our mind, be planted uh, in God's house. Uh, we just have a, uh, just a few moments uh, left in this particular podcast, uh, but I want to give you an opportunity to kind of tie things together and share uh, just what's on your heart. Uh, in these final few moments together. Yeah, I mean, I would just, I, I, we can maybe link some resources for people in the show notes to this of some um, reading. I mentioned The Queering of the American Child, um, which is a book that recently came out. It's not necessarily from a Christian perspective, but really does outline a lot of the history of this really well, I think. And it's very new. It just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah. But I would just encourage us all to not be asleep to this. And I hear the same thing from, from friends um, of kids in schools or even my teacher friends who say like, this isn't in my school. Like that's not, that's not happening. It's, that's all a, a right wing conspiracy theory. And I one want to say that this is bipartisan. It does not matter what political part that this is, yes. this is happening. They don't care what, where you fall on the political spectrum. Um, this is wrong. You need to be speaking out against it. Um, but also it's very sneaky in the way that it is being embedded. So it may not be as explicit as maybe you're even looking for, but what do yeah. you think is happening when teachers are being trained to think this way and then becoming a teacher and teaching in a public school? It's only a matter of time. It, yeah. If you don't think it's prominent, it will be soon. And I would say, even if it isn't prominent, it's, it's embedded into some of the things that kids are going to be learning. Um, and they make it sound really nice by saying things like social emotional learning and um, inclusivity and stuff like that. And so we just need to be really yeah. careful. So I think, you know, reading up on things, being aware of what's happening in your communities and not being afraid to be challenged in your way of thinking um, is really important. I think when, again, when engaging in conversations like this, which need to happen, by the way, um, I think they often are better done in person, but oftentimes now with social media, this stuff happens online. Really think about how you're interacting with people and what's going to make them think, because 
we can stand on the truth. And like I mentioned before, the vast majority of people who are being fooled by this are governed by emotion. And yeah. so you might just be able to plant a seed by saying something that's factually true, like saying, have you ever looked into the work of Michel Foucault? Like, yeah. if, and leave it there, you know, and they can go Google the person and figure out really quickly what a freak they are. But yeah. things like that, and they'll try to, to to manipulate you. And they'll they'll say things like, "Oh, well, pastors pastors harm children all the time," which is a logical fallacy. <laughs> Obviously, that's not even what we're talking about. We're talking about this other thing, and they make it about something else. And you can say something like, "I oppose all evil. I oppose all sexualization of children." Period. Doesn't matter yeah. who's doing. It. So yeah. right now we're talking about drag queen story hour and just kind of redirect the conversation. So I would encourage you to have conversations too. Yeah. Um, it can be awkward and people will be offended, but I think it will help you firm, make a more firm stance and solidify your view on this according to scripture. So yeah. that would be my encouragement, especially, especially for the women, because I feel like, we are more emo more um, apt to be emotionally deceived and they know that people know yeah. that. And that is why you see this so prominently featured in mom groups, parenting groups, things that are targeting women and young moms. So yeah. um, that would be my encouragement for everyone is to just lean in. This stuff isn't easy or fun to talk. I don't want to be talking about this, but I absolutely believe that it's necessary. Um, and once you see it, you kind of can't unsee it. So we need to address yeah. it for for the future of our children. As I got in the car on Saturday to head to the protest and it was all canceled, I said to my friend, I said, of all the things I thought I'd be doing now in 2024, I didn't think I'd be spending my Saturday bringing my uh, young teenage daughter who wants to stand against uh, this nonsense uh, along with me and protesting that it wasn't on the list of things. But you know what? <laughs> Uh, we're alive in this moment. God's called us in this hour to be clear because he loves people and we love people and the truth still sets people free. Brittany, thank you so much for taking the time to explain each of those things to us. Uh, how can people find you? You can find me on Instagram is where I'm most active or my podcast. It's at heaven and health pod on Instagram. And then my podcast is called the heaven and health podcast, which is available on all podcast platforms. Brittany LaBeouf, you're, you're brilliant. Love you. Thank you. And uh, thanks for tuning into the podcast today. Thanks, everyone. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I hope this message has inspired you to courageously stand up, speak up, and to live out your faith. If you like what you heard today, give me a five-star review, follow the Courage Over Cowardice podcast, and share it with others to learn how to stand for truth in the midst of culture.